Hello, I think I'm live. I'm just going to check to make sure everything's working on the back end. But I hope everyone's okay. It's uh, it's half twelve, but it is a Friday, so it's not like I have to be up tomorrow. And I have a really big glass of whiskey that I'm going to drink during this rant, because that's all this is going to be. This is just going to be me venting my spleen at the the absolute fucking state of entertainment. Like, I hate everything Hollywood produces these days. And when I say Hollywood, it's the sort of the media industrial complex. You know what I'm talking about, right? Like, Netflix, Amazon, uh, you know, any, any of this, any of, any, you know, mainstream movies, just all of it, just all of it is made by totally unimpressive people. I'm just bombarded on a daily basis with how shit it all is, and I just can't take it. And Rings of Power is, is pretty much the er example of it, but like, ah, we'll get into it, man. We will, we will get into it, because I'm just, oh, God. I just, I just watched about three quarters of episode five. I got to the point where I was just like, I just can't take it anymore. I just get, like, every Friday, I'll sit down in the evening, I'll put this thing on because I'll be like, look, maybe it'll get better. Maybe it'll get better. Because obviously I love Lord of the Rings. And I'm just like, you know, I'm not some sort of Tolkien scholar. You know, the the person you want to go to is uh, just some guy who, who just does the... He is an, an absolute autist when it comes to... And I say this in a good way, when it comes to Tolkien law. I'm not an expert in Tolkien law. So I'm, I'm not really very bothered about a lot of the law stuff. It's the storytelling that I hate more than anything. It's so terrible. Um, anyway, I'm gonna, can I can I brag about the latest thing I've painted before I get stressed by all of this? I haven't even set anything up in the back end. Hang on. Uh, I just it just instantly started pissing me off. This <laughs> this bullshit. <laughs> but uh, anyway, before I, before we get started, right? So check this out. Check this out. This is this is my Hellbrew or Chaos Dreadnought, as I would have known it. But man, I, this took uh, ages, but I'm I'm really chuffed with it. I um I painted the I I, I airbrushed the um, plates, so there's still like little like bits of dirt, but I, they're not permanent. But anyway, I, I I airbrushed the plates, so you get I've got this nice sort of fading effect. Then I had to do the rest of it by hand, but I'm really pleased with how it came out. I just 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 wanted to brag about it. Really, I worked really hard on it. I'll probably get killed instantly when my son's Necrons take the field next. But I'm really chuffed with how he came out. Anyway, let's uh Oh, let's get into it. Fucking hell. So <clears throat> I don't even care that it's woke, right? I don't even care that it's woke, it's full of race swapping, all of it like that is just so low down on my list of priorities with this absolute bullshit, right? The problem with it is it's just shit. It's like the the She Hulk thing. I don't care about She Hulk at all, right? And so I watched a couple of episodes of that, and it was laughably bad. But it wasn't boring, right? And then, like in every scene, I was like, okay, there is some conflict going on. There are people who disagree with one another, and the story is being told competently, even if the story is shit, right? At least the story is being told competently, and so I'm not watching it, I'm not bored, and I'll talk about She-Hulk another time, I think, because it's just like, it's a whole thing to unpack with that, and that'll just drag me off course, right? But it, it's it's not incompetently told, and so I'm not bored from scene to scene to scene, I'm waiting to see the next piece of shit that I'm delivering and laugh at, ha ha ha, that was crap, oh my god, how embarrassing for the people who made this, how embarrassing for the actress, how, you know, at least there's some engagement and entertainment there, right? But that is just not the case with Rings of Power. Rings of Power is unfathomably dull. I, it is gruelling to get through. Like, we're five episodes in, and I honestly can't even tell you what's happening. I just don't care. I just don't care enough. That's why I've got this recap from The Guardian up. Because I was just like, right, what the fuck happened in that last episode? Because I just can't remember. <laughs> it just, it goes in one ear and out the other. There is nothing gripping about this. The, the most, the most, the, the most I can say about that I like actually is uh, Elrond and Durin, right? 
they are the things that I like the most because they at least have some sort of challenging interactions, you know. And the, the uh, Durin and his wife, whose name escapes me because the only reason I can remember who Elrond and Durin are is because they're relevant to the other series. Uh, and oh, God, just I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna hold off on my complaints about Durin. Not that I, I, like, I don't dislike the character, but it's just wrong setting, I would say, for the tone of the character. Oh, God. I just, that That's literally all that's interesting in this entire thing. And, oh, my God. I hate girl bosses. I've decided I just hate girl bosses. And it's not just Rings of Power that makes me hate girl bosses, but, of course... It's, it's just everything Hollywood produces now. Girl bosses. It's girl, girl, girl. Rah, 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 rah. All right. All right. Well, question. Why have they all got the same basic insecurity about them? Why do they all feel fundamentally insecure in what they're doing? Right? Because, I mean, I would never have described, and people go to the, the Ripley example all the time. Oh, Ellen Ripley. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Ellen Ripley, right? At no point would I have described her as a girl boss. I would describe her as a hero who rose to the occasion and did something heroic. She's not a girl boss. She doesn't go around bossing people around with this kind of unearned moral and egotistical superiority complex. That's just not a part of the character, right? And so the character herself is relatable, right? She's someone... I'm, I'm not a woman. I've never had to rescue a child from an alien monster or anything. But... I can see the difficulty she's going through, and I find it relatable. And the fact that she is brave and actually engages, you know, I, I don't think I would have done it. I'm like, especially this is not my child. That's a dangerous looking alien. I don't know whether I'd do it, right? <laughs> but Ripley does it. I'm sure I would if it came to it. But you know what I mean? Like, there are genuine stakes, and it, it's not about Ripley. Because that's the thing. That's the problem that I have with the concept of the girl boss. And why the concept of the girl boss can just take a long walk off a short pier. It's all about the person. It's about the woman. And the thing is, and I hate to point this out to the people who write women in Hollywood, but leadership is not about you. That's what it fundamentally boils down to. This narcissistic, self-absorbed bullshit where it's like, oh, look, the woman, isn't she the woman in charge? So it doesn't matter, and I kind of hope she dies, actually, because of this selfish, just, again, narcissistic interpretation of what it is to be in charge. I can't stand it. To be a leader is to be concerned about everyone but your fucking self, which is why leaders are supposed to go down with the ship, you know, heroically sacrifice themselves for others. You know, do something important. Fucking, instead, it's all about narcissistic self-aggrandizement, and I can't stand it. I'm just so over it. It's just like, every woman these people write is just... It's it's like nails on a chalkboard, right? I just can't stand seeing them. I'm not interested in hearing from them. And I know everything they say is going to be utterly self-serving and come at the expense of the people around them, which is not what leadership is. It's disgusting, actually. And what's really disgusting is the fact that they, they, they are literally like puppeteering women, holding them in front and saying, look at this horrible person. You hate her because you're a misogynist. It's like, no, I hate her because she's awful, actually. Uh, there are lots of women who aren't awful, but that one is. And for some reason, that one's the one you're shoving in my fucking face. And it's like, okay, well, I just hate that person. You know, sorry. That, that, that person's shit. That person's shit. Why do you keep presenting me with all of these shit girl boss characters? You know, just, pre like, uh, <laughs> just present me with one that's not shit. Present me with one that is not a, an insecure, selfish bitch. That, is that too much to ask? Is that too much to ask? But again, I could go on with the She-Hulk thing, but I'll, I won't, right? I'll keep it to this. So, <laughs> so like, the, I, I'm going to use this as a mnemonic, right? Because, frankly, I can't fucking remember what's in this. It's just so unmemorable. And when you think of the actual Lord of the Rings films by Peter Jackson, or the books, of course, which I have read... There are so many characters that are so memorable and so many events that are 
thematically and like mythologically important and that so many memes are still produced from the original lord of the rings source material and the peter jackson movies that every day you see them going around like there's some new remix of a of a lord of the rings meme because it's just timeless and constantly relevant to what's going on right nothing has come out of this I've seen no memes of this being passed around as a thing. And you can see, and you can tell that's how you know this has had zero cultural impact. And it's because the whole thing is basically a kind of mirror into the souls of the people who made it. And these people are just really out of touch with the rest of the world and don't know what it is that people want, right? But let's let's begin with, oh my fucking God, Galadriel. I just, I just want, a sea creature to come up and eat her. I just want her to fail or die or... Just, like, I in the first episode, I think it's the first episode, where they're like they're going through the snow and like five meters away, someone falls over her and she's like, leave them! It's like, right, would Aragorn have said that? Would fucking Gandalf have said that? You know, no! <laughs> you know, <laughs> like this... Gandalf would have like, if, if it's Frodo hanging off the edge of the, the bridge... When the Balrog was coming, Gandalf wouldn't be like, nah, fuck him. Let's go. No, no. Gandalf was like, no, you guys go. I will deal with the Balrog and sacrifice myself. You know, you guys go. She's she's just the opposite of that, right? It's selfishness. It's entirely selfish. This is about her and no one else. Everyone else is a pawn in her scheme at best, right? And this this little, like, sword fight scene was just... Oh, God, I just can't... I can't take it, right? I'm going to have to keep drinking. I told you, I'm literally just going to vent my spleen at this. So, this whole thing was ridiculous, right? If you are some glorious sword-fighting champion, which Galadriel appears to be all of a sudden, why do you need to make the noobs look pathetic? Is that good for their self-confidence? Is it good if you are a chess grandmaster and you've got your, you know, your 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 trainee in front of you? Like, yeah, I'll teach you how to play chess. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, you fucked. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, you fucked. Boom, boom, boom. See if you can take one of my pawns, okay? I'm literally going to destroy you without l losing the thing. They're going to be like, okay, well, I really hate chess now. <laughs> this was you flexing over a bunch of people who had no chance against you. That's not leadership. That's you being selfish and egotistical. Again, I, like, I've only got so many selection of words to describe how profoundly, like, just solipsistic this whole thing is, right? Secondly, I mean, are they using sharp swords in this, right? I, I, you can't tell because the props don't look sharp, whether that's the prop or it's not meant to be a sharp sword in the thing, right? But let's assume it's not meant to be a sharp sword. Best case scenario, right? Because this, she's like having this wild fight with a bunch of people who are total trainees, right? No experience whatsoever. Don't know what they're doing, right? I mean, look at this guy's expression. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's just awful. And they're swinging these swords around like they're made of foam. In fact, they're swinging them around like they know no one is going to get hurt. Like they've read the script and they've choreographed this in advance. Right? You would not train with sharp swords without wearing armor. You just wouldn't do it. That'd be suicidal, right? You're going to get loads and loads of injuries. And even if they were just, like, blunt swords, you'd still wear some armor, because even if it's blunt, it's still a metal pole that you're smacking someone with that would really fucking hurt and could quite easily break a bone, right? So you would not just be wildly having this psychotic fight where she's constantly putting the sword against their throat and stuff like that. It's like... This is this is mental, okay? But again, the whole thing written as if it is scripted, right? The actors look like they are actors wearing a costume, like they're cosplaying Lord of the Rings. And so every time I'm watching this, I'm just taken out of it. They look like people who are pretending to be elves or pretending to be hobbits or dwarves or Numenorians or whatever. Like, they are people who are so obviously like actors that i'm taken out of the experience and i can't enjoy it right that is the i think the most the high crime of this really is that i just can't 
get myself invested because nobody looks like there's any chance of something unexpected happening everyone looks like they know exactly what's coming next because they all read the script oh, i don't die in this scene so there's no gravity to any of it there's no seriousness there's no somberness we're being told that like the world's coming to an end right elrond has a conversation with durin about how the whole whole elven race is doomed unless they get mithril like, it just says it like it's like well i really would like to go and have a cup of tea right now yes yes my tea is at your house is it okay if we get tea your tea's at my house and you really want that tea well i guess oh i guess i will it's like we're talking about the fate of an entire race of elves here, aren't we? Like, isn't doesn't this deserve a little bit of just somberness? And again, like with Numenor, like they're acting as if there's no threat. Like the closest we get are these with Tits McGee and her elven lover, which is just oh god, it's put a shirt on, right? You you there's no reason. For you to be wandering around with a push-up bra for a start, there's just no reason for it. And do I believe that just some random farmer woman is just this elf is like, yeah, I'm two thousand years old, but or a thousand years old or whatever. You know, he's, at one point he's like, he's saying to this fourteen-year-old, "It took me two hundred years to build up the courage you have at 14. So, well, we don't all get the opportunity for an extended adolescence, I guess. But are we really to believe that this guy's hundreds of years old can look at a human as if they are the intellectual, moral, equal of an elf, right? Obviously, the elves... Again, I don't want to go into the lore of it, because, of course, they've done a terrible job with the lore. Uh, but I'm not a lore expert, so that's not my problem. Like, are we to believe that this elf is going to be like, hmm, maybe I'll have a romantic relationship with this attractive human? Come on. Just come on. It's embarrassing, right? And then and you can see here, she's having her girl boss moment. Who'll follow me? Who the fuck are you? You're like a farmer or like some woman who deals with sick cows. Why the fuck would anyone follow you? Like, you have never... Like, how many armies have you led? Like, there is a lifetime of training when it comes to actually being a commander. And you've had none of it, but you're going to have a girl boss moment. A bunch of people are like, yeah, I'll follow you. Why? <laughs> fucking stupid the old man is like yeah she's gonna get us killed i'm gonna go play my allegiance to sauron well I, he, he's not wrong is he he's not fucking wrong oh god i can't stand this right so what else oh the hobbits oh fuck i'm sorry the harfords because we didn't get the rights to say hobbits Why are they Irish gypsies? The hobbits, as Tolkien said repeatedly, are the English peasantry from the shires. They're the yeomen, right? Now, the thing about the English is they've been settled in England for a very long time. Like, literally over a thousand years. They don't go anywhere, is the point. They've stayed in this place for a very long time. So they've decided, right, it's a sort of precursor to the Hobbits. We're going to have Irish nomadic gypsies. Okay, well, I saw, like, the Irish Times complaining about this, being like, we're not exactly being well represented here, are we? It's like, no, not really. Uh, these these people are just insufferable, and I don't know why they exist. And I, I saw, like, other people being like, well, I thought they were charming. So like, I didn't. Uh, I thought they were really crap. And what's worse is their ethics, which I just think is abominable. Oh, we've got to migrate. Why do you have to migrate? You know, why not, like, plant some trees in this area? Why not raise some goats or something? You know, why go on this perilous journey? It's like, okay, well, no, no, we have to. Okay, fine. You have to. But so-and-so's broken his leg, so he's just going to get left behind. And then we're going to sit there and say, oh, we'll, we'll have our little um, our little ritual where we go, oh, yeah, we remember those people we left behind. So, you know what? You actually don't have to leave behind people who are injured because i can see you have fucking carts you could put them on the carts and carry them you selfish pricks i god it does my head is like no nah, he's just gonna have to die of starvation on his own sorry but yeah this we're, we're such a tight-knit band of gypsies it's like get fucked 
You are awful. You are totally awful. You are selfish cunts. That's what you are. Not You're not prepared to put yourselves out for each other. As soon as someone becomes a hindrance, you're like, yeah, well, into the wilderness with you. We're migrating. Bye. That was a shame that, you know, you had the bad luck to break a leg. I can't fucking stand it. Right? These are not good people. These are selfish people. These are not people who actually care about each other. Uh, just, oh, it just drives me mental. Uh, just everything about this. And again, they, they just seem so inauthentic. Like, everything about this is inauthentic, right? Like, I, like, look at what they're carrying. Everything looks like a fucking prop. Everything is a prop in an obvious movie or a series, whatever. You know, nothing looks real. Like, I didn't look at Gandalf's staff and think that's a prop. I didn't look at fucking, you know, anything in the original Lord of the Fil- Rings films and thinks that's a prop, you know? <laughs> but I can't stop seeing the the very obvious prop nature of these things. <sighs> so what else happened that annoyed me? Let me st- yeah, so the Numenorians, right? So uh, apparently there's something that's, that's bad for Numenor, right? And they're like, it, you know, Gladriel's like being an insufferable bitch and the 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 leader of Numenor is another girl boss <laughs> oh brilliant oh oh i'm so glad there's another girl boss at Numenor you know oh god oh, wait, girl boss is everywhere that's popping up and they're all a bunch of selfish cows can't take it can't take it can't people being like yeah it's billion dollar dollar money laundering except maybe you know i mean i really you can only you can only put so much down to incompetence before you have to start considering malice. No one's this incompetent, especially not with this much money. No one gets given like a billion dollars, and then, I mean, look, prop, obvious prop, 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 prop. It's just nothing looks real. Nothing looks real. Why is this so dirty? Like old books get dirty because of five hundred years of being stuck on a shelf. This is like a ledger or something. Why would this be dirty? Why wouldn't it be clean? Oh, don't, know. don't even get me started. Anyway, so, um, yeah, so Numenor, right? They're, like, raising an army. Okay. None of the actors feel like they're in an army. Like, uh, Gladriel at one point is like, yeah, these, these, these people hit, like, stone trolls or something, or stone giants, but they're, they're really crap. And then she's, like, outside, like, lined up, and one of them's, like, this five-foot-four black woman, and it's like, right, yeah, average Tolkien esque warrior, okay? And the others are just, like, really, I mean, you know, they still like Californian millennials or Zoomers. <laughs> so it's just, like, none of them look in any way intimidating. And they, there's some two who go out onto this boat, and the boat ends up blowing up. And there's just no weight of importance to anything that they do. Everything is frivolous. Everything is frivolous. Like, whatever they're doing... It just feels like the director was like, yeah, so you say that and go there and go there and then blah, 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 blah. And they just go, yeah, and so I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I'm doing the other. It's it's like a school play. It's genuinely like a school play. Like, I don't feel that, that anyone feels that there are any consequences for anything they're going to do. And there doesn't appear to be any consequences for anything they do, really. And so it's just, it's just shit. It's just really, really shit. And we keep hearing about Saren. Oh, yeah, we at one point we see, I assume it's like, you know, the new slim Sauron, Sauron, who's just like you know the the wheel uh, the guy that we saw the you know the slim shady hair, and it's just like okay, again you look like a drama student, like it's just nothing there that impresses me whatsoever. And the uh, the the well, he is the wizard. We know he's a wizard now because he. With the hobbits who fights, scares off the wolves or fights off the wolves. And it's just like, okay, great. <laughs> Lucky he was there, I suppose. <sighs> I, just, I just don't care at all about any of those things. Um, but yeah, so this, like, the orcs were just like, oh, you're going to have to kill this kid to, get the, to, to pledge allegiance to Sauron. It's like, okay, okay, you don't get to see it. So you don't know if it actually happens. I assume he did, but like the guy could have had a heroic moment and been like, because like the the orc or whatever is uh, to this old guy, he's like, no, you know, pack uh, an oath must be made in blood, which no, they, they don't actually, but okay, fine, let's assume that Sauron's minions have this particularly high standard. 
the guy could have been given a kind of redempted arc and you know it's like he's got a knife and he stabs himself maybe and if that happened i missed it because fucking i wasn't paying that much attention i'll be honest because at this point i was just like oh god but he could have stabbed himself fulfilled the, the bargain and the kid could have taken on a kind of role there right he could like this would have been a traumatic experience he'd have gone through okay now this is serious and the last thing we see or at least the last thing i saw before i stopped watching uh was like the orc army going off to this tower where the elf and the remnants of the easterlings or whoever they are um like i can't remember what they're called now um are there and so i you know i assume there's going to be some tremendous battle that they're going to win Right, so let's go on to, oh god, just everything about this. Right, the elves. Everything about the elves just seems like a very poor sort of high school play. Everything about them. Their their costumes, their attitudes, the way they deliver their lines, as if they are amateur Shakespeare theatre performers. That's, ev- that's entirely how they come across. Right? Their wardrobes, the sets... Everything about it, like, you you would think, like, they would have something that makes them not look like elves, uh, not look like normal people as well. Now, uh, and this, oh, this was the thing about Galadriel, right? Look at her hair. Sorry, her, can you, can she wash her hair, please? Like, I was watching it earlier, and it just became profoundly obvious that she hadn't washed her hair that day. Look at this disgusting hair. It's like, um... What's his face? The dwarf from Lord of the Rings. Why can't I remember off the top of my head? Not Durin. That's the other one. Not Thorin. Gimli. Right? Why would Gimli be like, my lady? Can I have a lock, a, a strand of your hair? No. Be like, can you go wash your hair? And maybe I'll ask for a strand of it. Like she, lo- it looks greasy. It's like, sorry, is this an elf? Is it? This doesn't look like an elf. <laughs> this looks. Like, sorry, I know it's a small thing, but, like, it just, it just sticks out to me, right? Anyway, um, yeah, so the, the elves just, the, like I said, the only thing I liked was Durin, Disa, and Elrond, right? But the thing is, think of how Gandalf was describing the Durin's bane, the dwarves delved too deeply and too greedily and awoke in the Balrog. And Durin is a deeply unimpressive character, really. He's just comic relief. Like, he's not... Like, at least... I, I didn't really like the Hobbit films, but at least um, the guy who played Thorin was... It felt like a serious character. He felt like a leader, right? He at least felt like someone who may have had some kind of historical impact. But, like, Durin, really, you're the guy who unleashed the Balrog, are you? You're basically a clown. Like, you're the dude, are you? Oh, God, okay. And the thing is, it makes you think, oh, Christ, maybe if I went back in history, how many of those guys are clowns? You know, <laughs> Richard the Lionheart, actually a clown. <laughs> Not likely, I think. You know, I think that probably more often these are more serious people than they're being depicted as in this. But what do I know, you know? Uh, I haven't watched House of the Dragon. I just, I, I've heard that it's good, actually, which is, you know, that's great. I just, i just not interested in Game of Thrones, to be honest. But uh, anyway, so then they they go to this feast, like, you know, Durin gets them to take the the table back, and then Elrond's like, the entire fate of my race depends on you getting me some mithril. It's like, okay, fine. I mean, I don't see why. He doesn't explain why either, but let's just assume that's the case. That seems big, doesn't it? Like, and Durin's just like, yeah, okay, well, you know, ha. I like hearing it. It's like, oh god, just it's just so shit. Everything about this is just so shit, and the and we are five episodes in at this point. Like, and I'm not even criticizing the previous like shit storytelling like when she jumps into the ocean. It's like right, as as like you know on the American side of the Atlantic, being like, no, I'm swimming back to Europe now. Like you know all of these things that people have gone over a million times. Like these are just absurd, ridiculous embarrassing pieces of storytelling like i just none of it is good 
None of this is good. Everything about this, ev- like the the smallest amount of texture in this is shit. And again, I can't overemphasize the obvious expectation the characters and the actors playing the characters have of knowing what's happening next right the characters act although fate is ordained and it doesn't matter how they behave or what to do because they know what to expect next and that is just totally wrong think of the scene where the fellowship is going through the mines of moria and uh is it Pippin drops the thing down the well. It's like, full of a toot, you know, and he's angry. Doesn't know what's coming next. Everyone's like, oh, God, thank God, a bit quiet. That could have gone worse. Then you boom, boom, boom. The drums in the deep. It's like, oh, God. Oh, no. Oh, no, there's a bunch of goblins going, oh, God, right, okay. Barricade the doors. Oh, God. The bombers, oh, they've got a cave troll. Oh, God. And no one, it feels like they think they might die. It feels like the characters are afraid for their own mortality. <laughs> like, <laughs> like. whereas compared to this, where you've got girl boss and the, the trainees all acting, like, and they, they go on the boat and they end up blowing up the boat, but they don't feel like they thought they might die, right? They feel like they know, yeah, but I've read till page 17 on the script and I know I'm going to be fine. So, I mean, like, you know, why would I put, why would I make it seem like I was afraid of what was going to happen next. I know what happens next, and I don't die in this scene, so, you know, that that's, and I, I, I could be completely wrong, I could be completely uncharitable interpretation, maybe, but that's just the feeling I get watching it. Everything feels scripted. Like, everyone knows what's going to happen next. Like, with the fight with the cave troll, uh, the snow troll in this was just, it was just a shit. You know, it was just, oh, the other elves, right, you stand there and do nothing. It's like, these are elves, aren't they? Like, we have seen elves in battle. Like, she's there with a company of warriors. We've seen elves in battle, and yet they just stand there as the troll smashes them around, and then Galadriel kills it like the champion girl boss that she is, and just slays it stone cold dead in, like, two seconds. It's like, okay. Doesn't even break sweat. No look of, like you know, surprise or outrage or anything like that on her face. So, okay. Right. So you're like level 100. That was a level five troll. Like, you know, <laughs> like it's like game of Dungeons and Dragons, you know, it, it just, I actually kind of feel bad for the people involved in this at this point. Well, I, I genuinely feel bad because all they can do is say, ah, I see you're a racist then, or you're a sexist. It's like, yeah, but also your show shit, you know, <laughs> like, uh, no, no, I've, I've, I've had, I don't know about this much of this and it's, it's whiskey, not brandy, but but so the question, why didn't they just hire Peter Jackson? Well, that, that, there's a story there cause, um, they did, I think Peter Jackson reached out to them or they reached out to him and uh and they were like hey do you want to be involved and he was like well it depends i need to see the script and they're like yeah okay we're not gonna send him the script and they just ghosted him and pete jackson was like why'd you do that you know i i i'm the guy who made the lord of the rings films <laughs> like <laughs> but obviously they knew their script was shit and oh yeah okay the script just it feels like it's been written by a teenager who is trying to copy Lords of Lord of the Rings? Right, the the there at once there is this desperate attempt to sound like the people are that like for example like Gladriel or Elrond or you know any of them to sound high minded and well educated, and then it also falls back into sort of essentially modern speak, uh, and then there's the attempt at like you know medieval peasant speak, but um. But none of it comes across in any way that they intend. It just comes across as shit. And why is what's the deal with all these bloody spam bots these days on YouTube? Like it's just awful. Sorry, I think I've just hidden them. That should no. There's another one, is it? Right. Hopefully that's gone. So I'm going to deputize some people. 
put put your say something in the chat if you want to be deputized. Uh, give give in a wrench to uh to get rid of this thing. Um, yeah, you say no hate watching. I'm not, I'm not even all right. Okay, short fat attack. I'm gonna I'm gonna give that. To, you you can have a wrench. Have a wrench. Keep an eye on the spam bots. Cheers, man. Um, but it's just like the the script. I did mod you. The script is terrible. The delivery is generally terrible. Like, Galadriel is the least likable character in the world. In every single scene, she's got to act like, oh, I, I can never show any weakness. I can never show any hint of compassion or sympathy or act like I'm not just an entitled bitch. And it's like, right, okay, but I, I actually don't like entitled bitches. That's made her a totally unrelatable character. And I... I know she's totally invulnerable to almost all damage, and so she's never going to die. She's going to win at everything because she is the girl boss. Like all of the other girl bosses, I know they're going to win everything they're doing. So I don't even need to watch. And so this whole thing is such a waste of my time and such an embarrassing formality. Um, I will rent someone else because, uh, but who who do I know who to who to trust? That's the thing. I don't know. Um, it, it's such a waste of my time that I'm just like, right, okay, why, why am I watching this? And I realize that the only reason I'm watching this is because everyone is like, this is crap and it's failing. Like, that's the only reason. And I'm, I'm just watching it gruelingly dragging it out to see how crap it is. And I just, I do, I just, I can't believe this is how they piss away a billion dollars. And there's such a large amount of money for this absolute crap. I just, and I, I feel bad because, like, like, you can see this, like, this Guardian article here, right? Why are they writing this? They're writing this because they realize, oh, God, the cathedrals, like, you know, this is one of the exigencies of the cathedral. And we can't let this fail. If this fails, this makes us look bad. And again, like, we can talk about the woke stuff. You know, oh, God, there's, there's a race-swapped people. Brilliant. I don't care. Like, I actually quite like Deesa's character because she has... And, right, that was another thing I wanted to talk about. Right, so, like, the, the reason that Durin, Deesa, and Elrond are fun is because in scenes, they have a conflict. Now, the conflict isn't like a mortal fight. It is often playful. It shows that there's actually at least two levels to the characters. What they want and something that they... The, they show they care about the other person, why they have an interest in the other person, right? And the, the Durin, actually, lying about the, the table, that was actually really good. That was, oh, I actually enjoyed that. Something about this I enjoyed. It's like going to the elves and being like, oh, this is a deep stone, this table. How did you get it? Blah, 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 blah. It needs to be re returned to my people, basically. And the elf is like, oh, you know, maybe on honor we should return the table. And he's like, yeah, I think we should. And uh, him and Elrond are standing there, and Elrond's like, you lied about the table thing, didn't you? And she's like, yeah, well, Deese wanted a new table, and I thought, you know. And that was quite cute. That was quite funny. But what it shows is that him and Deesa have, like, a kind of, you know, a hard... They're both hard-headed people. They have a sort of head-butting relationship. But underneath, they obviously love each other. And, you know, he they do things for each other. So the, the, the rhetoric doesn't match the actions, and you can see by the actual things that they do that they actually care about. Them. And that's actually cute, right? There's actually a good relationship. Again, the woman who plays Deezer is actually an entertaining character. He's quite entertaining, and, you know, Elrond's interactions with them are fine, you know? They're, 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 they're the bare minimum adequate. And that's... I'm, and I honestly, I do think maybe the only reason I'm enjoying those interactions is because the rest of it is so shit, Right? Because there isn't really any actual conflict between any of the other characters, right? The, like the um the, uh this this one, right? This the these two, right? Essentially, all they can say is how great the other person is. That's essentially all they can do. Like, oh, you're a, you're a, a stunning and brave girl boss, but I fear the power of Sauron's too much. It's like, oh, okay. You know, I thought that you guys were meant to be romantically involved. I mean, you could at least have some sort of relationship. And then, like, um, her with the other girl boss. It's like, well, you know, we've got to go and do this thing. Well, I guess we're all going to have to girl boss it up together. And it's like, but you're not challenging the person on anything substantive. You know, it's always just, we're really great 
but we're are we going to be great enough you know that's the question and that's it makes every interaction between the characters just really hollow and forced and really uninteresting to watch frankly you know it just i don't need to be i don't need the characters to to like act this way i need them to act as if they have a challenge right as if they they are trying to establish actual relationships and are not just parroting lines at each other and i assume this isn't all green screen right so that's at least to its advantage but like it just feels like they're on a set parroting lines to each other and the lines were written by someone who's never written anything before like this is their first time and uh, remind me if i'm wrong uh chap but like is um what what uh, is the per the people who made this like wasn't this like their first like big feature debut or something they've done like some small petty things but like this was their first big thing i, I remember hearing that somewhere and it's just like really of all the things to give like some untested wet behind the ears noob you give a billion dollars on lord of the rings that is just wild it is worse than the walking dead right so the walking dead i actually enjoyed for the first like six or seven series actually uh, until rick died basically um and even then i was just kind of watching it see how much worse rick could make things but you remember with rick and um what's his name the dude um guy who shaved his head and rick had to kill in the first season oh i can't remember his name now remind me remind me of his name remind me of his name I can't remember. Um, but the... Uh, Ke Shane. Shane. Yes, that's it, right? Yeah, right. So the, the conflict between Rick and Shane, very much, like, in the same way as the sort of Deesa and Durin thing, right? Like, there, there are multiple layers to it, right? So Shane has the view that, actually, we need to do this to survive the zombie apocalypse. Rick has a different conflicting view, but they are friends, right? They care about one another. They actually are, like, you engaged with taking care of one another's interests in a certain way and they have an emotional and sentimental bond and so when they're coming to blows over something you can see shane like rick is a lot more hard hard-headed than shane and so rick's really quite being you know being quite bearing overbearing about it and shane has to kind of you know just you know bite his lip and you know eventually just go off on his own and i was gutted actually at the end of the i think it was the first season where he kills Shane. It's like, no, he shouldn't have killed Shane. Shane should have escaped and become some sort of bandit leader. And then, like, in season three or four, then they should have had, like, some big war, you know, and then Rick should have captured or killed Shane then. Uh, but fine, whatever, you know. I, I actually, honestly, the first, like, five seasons of Walking Dead were actually genuinely good, I thought. Um, the governor was great. <laughs> Again, peak Sigma male. I love the Sigma memes. They're so funny. The governor's uh, definitely definitely missing out on those sigma memes i think um but the point was there was there was genuine conflict between the two characters in circumstances where they had to cooperate and that made them appealing to watch you do not get this in lord of the rings rings of power you do not get that and it's insufferable uh you do get it in the original lord of the rings film and this is again just as if these people have never written anything you know, and of course, this is not getting to what I mean. Look at these, look at these actors. Like none of them look in any way, like <laughs> they just, like Viggo Mortensen looked like he may have been out in the woods for like ten years or however long, fifty years, whatever hour going to have been out there for. You know, he had a seriousness about him, he had a gravity about him. He looked the part. You know, even Carl Urban, he must have been quite young at the time, looked like he could have been a warrior you know gandalf looked like a wise old man he spoke like a wise old man he had the kind of authority in his voice you know, he, he, you know they 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 felt because and, and this is another thing as well right you can tell the quality of actors has declined it's not just that they come from california or whatever right look at the actors involved you you had um the dude who played gimli gandalf christopher lee playing saruman you had actors who had been 
properly trained. They came from a different era where these people had actual, like, genuine presence. They were taught to project their voices. You know, they were... They, they, they had diction. They had rhetorical skills. They actually felt like they could act. Whereas these people just feel, again, like teenagers in high school drama. It's just embarrassing, and I hate it. I hate everything about this. It's... On every level, this is shit. Just on every level. And again, I haven't even talked about the wokeness stuff. I'm, apart from the girl boss, I suppose. Because that's obviously a product of wokeness. None of the women are allowed to fail. Which is just... Okay, why would I be involved in emotionally involved in the struggles of someone who's going to succeed in everything all the time? Why would I care? I don't care. Yeah, well, she's going to win, isn't she? Don't care. Oh, look, Gladriel kicked the ass of all of these noobs who she was flexing on for some reason because she's an egotistical bitch. Don't care. You know? Oh, look, she killed the troll oh, all by herself. Oh, who could have imagined? Like, you know, but the race swapping thing actually. Because, like, it's just weird how they made, like, the Easterlings, who were actually non-white, a bunch of English white people. Why would you do that? That was the right time for some diversity. Why didn't you use that? And, like, okay, whatever. Who cares? But, like I said, I, don't, I just don't even care about the wokeness in it. The wokeness is just by far from the worst thing about this. The worst thing about this is just that it's really poor. And that's reflected in the reviews as well even like the hollywood like the the woke supporters just like oh god <sighs> that was shit uh i'm gonna have to write a review oh it was stunning and brave but it was really boring and it was drawn out and it fails to hit the beats blah 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 just now the easterlings uh they're, they're clearly meant to be middle eastern you know they're not you know, they're, they're obviously meant to be some sort of Middle Eastern or, you know, Central Asian uh, people, which is fine. I mean, it's perfectly interesting a adversary to have. It's not like these people haven't invaded Europe plenty of times in the real world. So why wouldn't they be invading Western Europe in a Tolkien sort of facsimile of it in his world? Why not? You know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not just that wokeness is the source of the terrible writing, though, as someone in the chat is pointing out, right? These writers would be terrible even if they weren't woke. That's the thing. The quality of the writers, the quality of the actors, it is so dramatically reduced from the quality just 20 years ago when Lord of the Rings came out. I mean, like, within living memory, you know? It's one generation it took for this to nosedive into the ground. Now, I'm sure there must be some, like, you know... Well, I don't know why they don't recruit actors who, like, are trained in doing Shakespeare or something, right? Like, the sort of Henry Branner style, you know, Christopher Lee, like, the chap who played Gandalf, whose name escapes me off the top of my head, um, and the guy who played Gimli. Like, I watched an interview with the guy who played Gimli, and I was stunned by how uninterested in Lord of the Rings he was. Like, he was this, you know, old Shakespearean actor. He did not give a shit about any of this. And he was like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. And it was, I think it was his son or something who came to him and was like, no, dad, you really have to do this. He was like, what, why? Why would I want to play a dwarf in some fancy thing? How bullshit is it? He's like, no, no, dad, this is going to make you a lot of money. He was like, oh, it's going to make me a lot of money. I'll do it. And that was literally the reason he did it. It was just money. But at least he was a classically trained actor. At least he could act. At least he could do it. You know, uh, Ian McKellen. That's right. Who's the guy who played Gimli? I can't. Remember. John Rhys Davis. Yeah, there's an interview with him on YouTube. Find it. John Rhys Davis. You know, talks about Lord of the Rings, and he literally is just like, yeah, oh, it's just the money for me. I didn't care about Lord of the Rings, but uh, but everyone seems to really like it. You know, <laughs> everyone's really into this. So, um, yeah, lo lots of Shakespearean actors, right? And you you can see the difference in the acting quality like the delivery of the lines you know that's the thing no one delivers everyone delivers lines this this feels very much like a daytime soap opera right an american daytime soap opera like the the lighting <laughs> like you know everything's very brightly lit and everyone delivers their lines poorly 
it's just one of the it's a daytime soap opera with a massively overinflated budget that's what this feels like to me and i just i i i mean i'm not even disappointed i wasn't i didn't have any high hopes for this i hope maybe they'd wash their hair or something if you're gonna pretend to be an elf at least have shimmering and the hair is not even shiny like how do you fuck up that so badly like the gimli was blown away by getting three strands of her hair and this woman can't even wash her hair for the scene just incredible just incredible i just i just can't get over how bad and uninteresting all of this is and i I just find these hobbits really annoying like i when they're on the screen i'm just counting the eternal seconds until they're off the screen until anything else because i mean at least at least i can hate the girl bosses you know but the hobbits are just shit they're just really dull and just really annoying it's probably all i've got to say for this rant to be honest but it's it is just genuinely shocking how far downhill i mean does hollywood just not produce competent people anymore like is it, are they just like how did this person how did, who, who's who who got the, you know, i've got the wikipedia up actually let's have a look right so who jd payne and patrick mckay who who are they what have they done this they don't even have wikipedia entries are you fucking serious how can they not have wikipedia entries That's not... That can't be right. right. But again, who who are these people? I mean, Lenny Henry is the only actor I recognise among any of these people. Hang on a second. This can't be right. This, they, it can't be that they don't have Wikipedia entries. I'm going to... I'm going to... Okay, they, they just don't don't seem to have wikipedia entries that's remarkable i have a wikipedia entry <laughs> well they actually they, they don't have wikipedia entries at least not according to google if google's in a, an authority on search engines oh no patrick mckay has jd Payne. Maybe, maybe it's under a different name oh wait I'm not sure this is the guy. <laughs> Psychopathic British serial killer. No, I don't I don't think this is the guy. I don't think that's Patrick McKay from Lord of the Rings. How do they have a Wikipedia page? Just, I, I I know I'm like stuck on that, but that's shocking to be honest. Let's see what uh let's see what Reddit has to say about them. Uh, J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay. Uh, overall, the group of people in charge seem very well picked. They have great experience in writing direction and good television. Do they? None of their scripts have been produced. That doesn't mean they're bad writers. Far from it. <laughs> now that we've seen one of their scripts, I think we've seen that they are, actually. So, <laughs> is that real? Chat. Like You're going to have to confirm and deny any of this. I'm just... That can't be none of the yeah. I'll get their IMDb page in. Right, so Patrick McKay is his IMDb. Right, what's he done? He was a writer on Flash Gordon. So you know Brian Blessed in Rings of Power though. Earlier screenplay unannounced. Oh, uh, announced right. Or is this a new thing? Star Trek Beyond writer uncredited. So is this a new one or what? I have no idea. But right, that's remarkable. So it seems that Amazon selected them because they must have really loved their second age pitch which was a mistake. Amazon thought their portfolio of work, whilst unproduced, 
would be ideal for a Lord of the Rings adaption. How the fuck can you be like, you got a great portfolio? None of it's been made, but I like the theme of the portfolio. I like the the what it what 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 you're imagining. Maybe you know the the competence behind it. We can't be sure of, of course, because none of it got made. But I mean, what a ridiculous, what a ridiculous state state of affairs. It certainly is the inverse of the norm in such tele big televised productions. Yeah, I bet it fucking was. Oh, good. We get to uh, measure it by the Bechdel test. That's good to know. That is just... I mean, I suppose this probably does pass the Bechdel test, which is uh, great, isn't it, guys? Passes the Bechdel test. That was the thing I was concerned about. For anyone who doesn't know, the Bechdel test is a feminist test where... Are there two women talking about something other than a man? And it's like, well, I mean, does Sauron count as a man? Because maybe, you know, it probably does pass it, to be fair. But yeah, uh, YouTube poop makers have better portfolios. This is just... And no, the script for Rings of Power was not written by AI in development at Amazon because it would be funnier. <laughs> it would be more interesting. You wouldn't know what was going to come next. But every time someone's speaking, I know exactly what they're going to say. I know what, the, the general theme and tone of what they're going to say. Like John D. Payne is exactly the same stuff. Yeah, this is wild. I don't understand how this has been made by guys who have never made anything before. And this really shows, right? Like, this actually really shows. The whole thing is just an, a total embarrassment. I'll talk about She-Hulk another time because there's a lot more to talk about there about themes of representation, right? Because again, like, who's represented in this? Who Who's actually represented? Who feels like they see something of themselves in it? Now, I'm not saying necessarily about straight white men or black, strong black women or, you know, whatever she's, single mothers, I guess. I don't know, you know. Like, who feels represented, like, by the virtues of the people involved because that's normally what you find appealing when you watch something on tv right when you it's not normally oh he black brilliant i'm black brilliant then we, we're basically the same and i'm so represented normally it's the substantive representation there right he's doing something that you would agree with or that you admire right none of these people are doing anything that i admire None of these people are doing anything that I agree with in that particular circumstance. Like, nothing that they do, I'm like, yeah, I would have done the same. I'm not in any way represented by any of these characters. And it's nothing to do with my skin colour. It's entirely about my morals and what I think would be the right thing to do in that particular situation. None of these people represent me at all. So who is this for? Who is this actually representing? And I'm guessing, I watched Doomcock's uh, video about the apparent uh, numbers that they're drawing now he was careful to point out that this probably you know it, it's uncertain it's un unverifiable because of course amazon what are they gonna do show us the show us the numbers probably not i guess probably embarrassing um uh, and apparently it's something like two million or something for the last episode not this one but the one before um so that's bad and i the thing is i can believe that that sounds like a kind of realistic number to me when it comes to this and it's because who who am I who's represented by this? Like who is represented by the selfish hobbits who just let wounded people die on their own in the wilderness? Who's represented by that? No one would do that. No one would do that. Like the objectivist hobbits here who just let people die because they're of no use to them anymore or something like that. And I'm I'm not I'm not being fair to the objectivists when I say that, by the way. But like no one is represented by these hobbits, which is why I'll find the Irish Times thing. Um, it was really funny. They were, they were really pissed off about it. <laughs> Rings of power. The new hobbits are filthy, hungry simpletons with stage Irish accents. That's one billion well spent. But yeah, that's pretty good, actually. <laughs> Filthy, hungry simpletons, eh? Mm. Mm. Good points. 
good points. And maybe if you guys had shut your fucking mouth during the Queen's funeral, I wouldn't have said they were good points. Uh, <laughs> Painting with a broad brush there, but uh, it was really insufferable, actually. The amount of Irish people who decided, me, 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 not my Queen. Yeah, we know. You're a fucking republic. Shut up. But uh, yeah, no one, no one felt represented by this. No one was happy with this. Like, no one <laughs> was... I'm having flashback to the EastEnders episode. Exactly. The whole thing feels like a daytime soap opera. Everyone thinks it. Just a really high budget daytime soap opera. You know, it's just... Gen like, yeah, the New Hobbits are sociopaths, just like the crowds demanding representation. That's true. Genuine sociopaths. Oh, well, you know, we sing our song to those people we let starve to death in the woods because they were slightly wounded. And they could have got better. I mean, Neanderthals look, used to look after their wounded, you know? Like they, they, I, I watched loads of videos about, like, pre-modern like uh, pre -modern man humans. And uh, I, 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 just, I don't know why I find it so fascinating. Because, like, 50,000 years ago, there were, like, a dozen different species of human being. Like, it's, it was really fascinating to me. Like, actual hobbits, like Homo floresiensis. Like actual hobbits existed, and like Neanderthals, they they're constantly being found. Whatever whatever lives the Neanderthals were living were really really rough, and they're constantly being found with broken bones that have healed, and fractures that have healed. And so at some point, like you know, Neanderthal guy charges a rhino or something with a stick, stabs it, gets walloped, bunch of stuff gets broken. He gets taken home, and then he gets put up, and everyone feeds him until he heals. And, uh, and these guys are like, yeah, no, fuck you. You're dead. We're out of here. You know, anyone who's not a peak of physical fitness can just die in the wilderness, as Rousseau imagined. You know, it's just shocking, absolutely shocking. This is the ethics of the the, the hobbits. This is just not what hobbits would be like, in my opinion. Uh, <laughs> it Well, yeah, no, no, a broken leg never healed in prehistory. Well, apparently, apparently not now, you know. Well, no, I don't like Irish in the chat. Uh, no, I'm just teasing, obviously. But um, just on a quick aside on that point, the uh, everyone everyone always talks about like oh the uncanny valley effect. Oh, there, maybe there was something that was nearly human but not quite human. Yeah, yeah, there were loads of them. We know there were loads of them. They were all through history, all through history, like. All these different kinds of pre-modern humans are exactly what we're talking about. <laughs> like, it's not some mystery. It's not some, like, oh, maybe they were, like, you know, weird demons or something that pretended to be humans. No, it's for when you are in the wilderness and you encounter a kind of human that is not Homo sapiens sapiens. It's Homo neand neander ne 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 neanderthal or whatever they call it, you know. And they're, they're, you know, Homo Denisovan, Homo whatever. There are loads of different types. I can't remember all the fucking names when I'm drunk. Um, but there are loads of different types. And it's like, yes, that's what the Uncali Valley effect is for. Something that's nearly human, but not quite. It's not a great mystery. It's not some sort of fucking, you know, it's not like about demons or like face changes or something like that. No, it's about just there were actually other species of human at one point. Mystery solved. Anyway, where was I going with all of this? Yeah, what's the other guy? Patrick McKay and um, J.D. Payne. Let's see what he's got. John D. Payne. Again, why don't they have Wikipedia bios? Escape? Never even heard of that. What's that? Uh, right, it never got released. Is that right? Okay. <laughs> just, just remarkable how people can be given so much money after having literally produced nothing. But he is a practicing Mormon, you know. That's good to know. That's just remarkable. Just incredible. Uncredited writer on Star Trek, just like the other guy. So these these guys like arm in arm going through Hollywood doing nothing. And Amazon are just like, would you like a massive treasure chest full of gold? I'm like, well, I don't know. What do you want for it? Well, we actually want something produced from it. But, like, here's just a billion dollars. Just go fucking nuts. I can, I can totally see. You say random people don't have wiki entries. Even if they were random people, 
uncredited writers up until like 2022 you would think now after getting the most expensive television series in history they would get a wikipedia bio i bet bet, what's my bio like i bet it's cancerous actually oh god they've got a fat picture of me that's not on can i get this picture updated please wikipedia please can i get this updated 305 million you fucks i've had way more than 305 million views on this channel let me see i Oh no way, I got a load of stuff deleted, didn't I? <laughs> okay, I used to have I used to have like half a billion views. And then stuff had to be deleted. Because things changed. But um anyway. When was the last time this was updated? It looks like it's not been updated for quite some time. To be fair, it's not that bad, is it? <laughs> good on Gerard Batten yeah that's not too bad actually I mean do, are they call me a Nazi at any point on the page no I debated neo-Nazi Richard Spencer okay yeah so they're not calling me a Nazi that'll do probably why I still have a YouTube channel to be fair Anyway, um, I guess I'll probably leave it there. Just because I haven't really got much else to say about this. I'll probably... I, I might I might catch up with the She-Hulk. I watched two episodes of She-Hulk. And I was just like, okay. It, like I said, it wasn't boring. It was just tremendously shit. I'm still an anti- anti-feminist on that. Well, I am an anti-feminist. Obviously. Feminism's fucking ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's just not that bad. It's not that, like... I... How to describe it? It just speaks to a profound insecurity in one's position in the world to be like, I'm a feminist. Like, that's all I hear. It's like, I'm actually lost and alone, and I really wish my dad would ring me and say, hey, you're doing a great job. That's what I hear when a woman says, I'm a feminist. You're right, I'm not a random person. I have a Wikipedia entry. Amazon, where's my billion dollars? I will make you a better Lord of the Rings than this, Amazon, if you want. I've never written anything, but then, you know, how do you know these guys have? And could it be any worse? Like, actually, I, I, I actually have studied linguistics as well. I actually think I could do a better job. I think I could write a more compelling script. And I think I'd be able to choose better actors for the parts. I think people, I, I, I would put money. I would stake my, I don't have a fortune, but any money I have... I would stake on the fact that I could do a better job if given the resources these guys were given on making a Lord of the Rings film uh, or just sh- you know show whatever. Was first wave feminism valid though? No, not really. I've decided just all of it. All, and the thing is, like, it's just the concept of ideology in and of itself is it seems to be a product of the Enlightenment. And I've come to view the Enlightenment kind of like a cracked prism where you get... Like a beam of one colour going off in one direction and a beam of another colour going off in another direction. And then idiots going, yeah, so that's the only colour that exists. And it's like, no, you're a retard. Uh, we can see the other colours and you have to make up stories as to why the people who can see those other colours are actually bad people. That's what you're doing. And it's like, no, it's just for some reason you've decided looking through the cracked prism is the way to get to the truth and it's like yeah the, like for example the, the white beam of light it does contain blue it does contain red it does contain green it does contain all of the other colors which are being you know scattered around the room but you know that came out of a beam that contained all of them so you can't just pick one and so like there, there's there's got to be some sort of holistic ideology that emerges from the enlightenment right like some retard like Vorsch going, I'm a consequentialist. It's like, no, you're not. You know you're not. 
Like, you can think of times where you don't just care about the consequences of the action. You care about how the action got to that consequence. And then, if you go even back further, you care about the intention of the action. So don't sit there and go, I'm a consequentialist. Because literally, you could be saying, well, if the most evil villain on Earth was intending to do something terrible, but actually ended up kept doing good things by accident, then he's a good person. You, you wouldn't agree to that. That would be fucking retarded. You are a retard. You are not any one thing. Nobody is any one thing. All of these things contain moral content. So the entire Enlightenment project of like splitting them up and pretending that this is the one thing or that's the one thing or the other is the one thing is wrong in the very conception of, the, of what it's trying to achieve. Like success, you know, completion, perfection, enlightenment, whatever it is you're aiming for, none of it will be found by deconstructing what we already had in the sort of pre-enlightenment traditional view of morality where each of these things is important your intention is important the method of expressing your intention is important and the results of your intention are important all of those were contained in pre-enlightenment morality of different kinds of morality as well but all of these different strands of it all contain those com core components because everyone agrees they matter. So don't give me this Kantian bollocks. Don't give me this consequentialist bollocks. It's bullshit. You're wrong. Okay, end of story. You're looking at this in fundamentally the wrong way. And I'm just not, I'm just done with the discussion of it. You're just wrong. End of story. Nick Rakita drunk stream. Drunk stream. Oh, it's Cal. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just I don't drink, right? I, I, this this is probably the first drink I've had in like a month. Well, I do not drink at all. I mean, I do. Like, I have one glass of whiskey, and, and it'll be normally about that much. Like, I've had... I mean, it's probably been about... So, this is basically like two glasses of whiskey for me. And, uh, yeah, I'm feeling it. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a drinker. I'm basically teetotal these days. Um, I might do more issues in the Enlightenment series. I've got a bunch of scripts in the works at the moment. I'm going to remind myself what they are. Sorry, I've been ill for the past week as well, so. Um, Reflections on the Queen's Funeral, I think is going to be a good one. Um, the left's virtues are all vices, which explains why there will never be a concord between the left and right, and why, essentially, the right has to just come to the conclusion that they, the left has to be crushed. Like, everything the left actually values as a virtue is a vice to the right. right? They, what they see as vices is actually a virtue to the right. It is a total inversion of the morality of the right. And if the left are going to commit to vice as being virtue, then you cannot reason with them, you cannot come to an accord with them, this is why the civil war is coming. They are driving it by abandoning any kind of traditional moral standards. Also, a critique of Jordan Peterson's conservative manifesto, which I wasn't happy with, I have to say. Jordan Peterson basically was presenting Reaganism, Thatcherism, and it was just like, but that's not conservative, really. That's uh, Whiggism, essentially. Uh, and, and that's worse than Whiggism, actually. It's neoliberalism. And I'm not a neoliberal. And I, <laughs> Neoliberalism got us to this point that we're at now, where everything's shit. And it's because what you're doing is thinning out, again, enlightenment rationalism, you're thinning out everything to, to these very thin ideas. It's like, like when he's like, oh, the free market. To be honest with you, fuck the free market. Like, there are, there are, like, I, I'm in favor of property ownership. I'm not in favor of un rampant unlimited markets. Like, when you say, right, I'm in favor of property ownership, things follow from that. If I own the property, then I'm at liberty to dispose of the property as I see fit. That's fine. A free market will say, well, why don't we have the free movement of labor? Why don't we have the free movement of money? You know, why don't we have it so that foreign billionaires can just buy up vast tracts of your capital city and then just sit on that empty property forever and so increase in value? Like, well, I can actually think of lots of reasons that are outside of the, the thin scope of the market that actually would say don't do that, right? The 
free movement of people, well, that's bad for the people in the country. Just having loads of foreigners in, that's bad on an economic level, it's bad on a social level, that's bad on a political level. Why the hell would I want new voters? Why, why would I want a single person to come in and dilute the power of my vote? If anything, I want people to leave so my vote becomes more powerful if I'm a citizen of democracy. And again, like, why would I want Labour to be a buyer's market? You know, I'd rather it be a seller's market because I'm the one working. Obviously not me personally, actually, because I'm actually buying the Labour. But <clears throat> if I was the worker, I would not want immigration. And so none of these are good. Why would I want foreign billionaires buying up land in my country? I mean... Before Reagan and Thatcher, that just didn't happen. That was prevented by governments because it was obviously against the interests of the citizens and the country itself. Because if you view the country in a more sort of aesthetic or sentimental way, if you view your civilization actually as some form of a work of art that you can feel personally attached to, well, then suddenly it becomes heresy to sell it off to a bunch of foreigners who don't give a shit about it and are just going to use it as a form of capital accumulation at your expense... Especially if you're piling in foreigners who, shock and surprise, have to live somewhere. Like, right, so all that you've got a housing shortage because of foreigners buying houses. You've also got a housing shortage because of foreigners coming in, different foreigners coming in, who need to live somewhere. Is it a fucking shock that in 1992, houses were four times the average annual wage, and now they're more than ten times? Like, this has been done through the free market that has destroyed the prospects of the just the native people of this country. And so Jordan Peterson going, yeah, free markets, free markets. No, right? Free markets are not some sort of eternal value that conservatives need to abide by. Property ownership is that value. And actually, the free market is the barrier to property ownership to the people of the country in which I live. The free market has made it so they can't buy houses. It just, and I'm not, I don't mean to go off because I, I, I like Jordan Peterson. I like him a lot. I've always liked him actually. I was one of his first supporters online. You know, I like, well, I remember when his appearance on that Canadian talk show came out and I totally saw, right, he gets it, he gets wokeness, he get he's, he's on our side. But it's just, this is just, it's very easy in what I guess we'll just call like, you know, the Reaganist paradigm, uh, to, to just say free market good. But actually, the free market's become a barrier to property ownership, and it's actually the property ownership I care about. Right? I want people to live in the Shire. You know, that's what I'm looking for. And to do that, you need your own small plot of land, and to have your own small plot of land, there can't be a million Somali and, you know, whoever other immigrants who are, like, trying to occupy the same land. It just doesn't work. And so the free market is actually the problem there. Right? It's not that markets as a concept are bad, but markets are a natural consequence of property ownership. When you own a property, you can sell it. End of story. We don't need to go any further than that. And I felt that too much of it, I'll, I'll, go, into, I'll go into the whole thing in a properly, a properly laid out uh, script, so I'm not just drunk and rambling. Yeah, rental properties everywhere. Yeah, brilliant. Everyone should be, you wish, you wish everyone was a hobbit. Yes, everyone should be a hobbit. Like, you wish you lived in the Shire. You know, do you know where, do you know where the highest density of rich and famous people is in Britain? Marlborough, which is a town in Wiltshire. It's basically Hobbiton. It's basically a little Shire town, a little fucking gorgeous little market Shire town. And it's, that's where all the rich and famous in Britain go. Reveal preferences, folks, okay? That's a lovely kind of life, to live in a small community where people know each other and nothing tremendous happens. You know, and that's the thing. Like, you get this, nothing important happens in the Shire. Great. That's where you want to live. You don't want trouble. You don't want drama. You don't want stabbings in the street. You don't want terrorist attacks. You, want, you just want the regular rhythms of life, to live your life happily. That's what you want. <clears throat> No, the stream isn't going to be privated. Yeah, the Shire was protected from the outside world by the Rangers. And uh, we we have Rangers who we usually call the Army and the Navy. 
Sorry, I'm going to sniff. <clears throat> Any chance you could invite John Peace on Lotus Eaters and discuss his manifesto and outline the problems with it? Well, I'll, I'll see if I can send him... I'll, I'll write a proper video where, like, you know, I'm not just drunk and ranting about it. Uh, and present my case uh, more clearly. Um, we, You know, we have firearms. We've got millions of guns in this country. They're just in the shires. And they're shotguns, rifles. Um, we don't have handguns. Because, <laughs> let's be fair, the amount of stabbings in the cities, do you want handguns? It'll just be, more sh it'll just be shootings. Um, I'm not... <sighs> no, my kids are the bloody super spreaders, right? Last weekend... I, and this is the problem the problem with kids. They go to school, they catch something and get some sort of runny nose. And they get runny nose for like a couple of days. Just and Literally, it's just a runny nose for them. I get it, and I'm ill the whole week. And I'm just like, oh, fuck's sake. But, um, yeah, I'll, I'll write a proper script and then send it across to him and see how he takes it. And, I'll, you know, I'll be a lot more congenial. There's the right word. Collegial? I'll 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 write properly and probably articulate my concerns because essentially I didn't see anything conservative about it. You know, it was it was still a rationalistic enlightenment project. I'm sure you can still find some old service revolvers around the shire somewhere. Yeah, you probably can. To be fair. Stop hiding behind the kids. They're the ones who infected me. Don't give me that. Yeah, shireism. Yeah, exactly. That's what I like. Shireism. Well, they're not dying from climate change, but that's uh, that's because I can't talk about what anything about on YouTube, you know. More people survive shootings than stabbings. Shootings tend to be one whole, not dozens. That's a great point, actually. Yeah, yeah no, that is a, that's a genuinely great point. And like uh, a bullet wound is probably smaller than a stab wound as well. Uh, Jordan Peterson knows who I am. I've spoken to him before. Now, it's not the coof. I can tell this isn't the coof. What this is is like a sinus infection. Like, um, the coof was like a flu. I ha I've had the coof a couple of times. Uh, it's like a flu and your, you know, your body aches. But this has been a really bad sinus infection. It kind of went into my lungs. So it's just a, a, a sort of thick cough. So it's, it's not it's not the coof. It's just cold. You know. <laughs> But uh, anyway, it's it's nearly two o'clock, so I better go. But um, anyway, thank you uh, for hanging out, and hopefully you were drinking as well on this Friday night. I do hope I haven't burned any bridges. Uh, I don't. I, I I don't think I was. Like again, like any of the people I criticise, like on the right, I do actually like and I do respect. You know, they are intelligent people, but I do wonder how much of their thought is siloed in a way. Um, and I'm not even saying mine isn't siloed. Mine probably is. Um, but I've been doing a lot of really interesting work. I've actually got a piece coming out called The Metaphysics of Conservatism, or Traditionalism, I think I'll call it, because I'm very wary of the term conservatism, conservatism either, at all. Like, it seems to me the... It seems to be a concession that the left is correct about progress and where they're going. And it's just the, I don't want to go as fast as the left. And I don't really agree with that because I don't like where the left is going. The left is going to the bug man, atomistic future where we're living in the pods, in the metaverse, eating our soy burgers. And if we're lucky, Klaus Schwab will give us a bug burger once in a while. That's not the world I want to live in. I like steaks too much, and I don't want to live in the metaverse. So uh, I'm. I think the conservatives are going to get dragged to that position. And I saw who was it the other day was saying, you know, like the the Ben Shapiro position would be like, right, guys, we're all in the we're all in the metaverse, but at least we don't have to have the trans flag on our metaverse goggles. It's like that's kind of <laughs> kind of like hard. Hard for, I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm sure Ben Shapiro would not agree with that characterization. 
Like, even like, no, that's not what I think. Obviously, that's not what I think. But like, uh, but there is an aspect of it that kind of rings true, right? Like, you know, this unfettered capitalism. Well, you know, some things need to be banned. Like, I don't think kids should have mobile phones at all. And that's not even speaking about access to social media, which they absolutely shouldn't have. Social media should be treated like heroin for children. Because I've seen it with my own daughter, right? When she was like 11, her mum got her a phone. And I was totally against it, but it was like she got the phone. And then she started, you know, trying to get on TikTok and stuff like that. And her mum would check her phone. And if she did, you know, she'd be in trouble. But after like the third or fourth time of her like setting up secret TikTok accounts, I was finally able to take the phone away. And man, she was just so much happier afterwards. She got this phone and she started getting depressed. And you could see it. She'd be in her room and she's just miserable. And now, after taking the phone away, she's just happy again. And it's like, there we go. It, I I knew it. I fucking knew it. This is like a drug. And when I took it away, she acted like a drug addict. She was, like, crying and screaming until the addiction was broken. And it was like, okay, well, there we go. It's genuinely an addictive drug. Mobile phones and social media. We're all addicted to it, but at least we're adults, right? <laughs> at least we get to make those choices. You know, we get to dr- get drunk and spew hateful views on the internet. You know, that's it. Because <laughs> we're adults, we've earned this. Uh, but she's you know, 13 now, so she doesn't get to do it. I, I am more harsh with technology usage than the fucking CCP, man. Like, the CCP have restricted uh, kids to one or two hours a night of video games or something like that. If my son, my, my son gets to play video games, my, my daughter never gets to play video games anymore. I've taken her laptop away. It's actually, uh, it's around here somewhere. I've, it's, it's over there. Um, I, I took away a laptop because she kept signing on to TikTok. Uh, so she, she doesn't get any kind of laptop or screen time on anything, which is brilliant, frankly. And my son only gets to play video games uh, a couple of hours of Ark Survival Evolved at the weekends because he can play with his nan. By the way, I have an Ark server. I, I put a video up on the Thinker if you wanted to go join it. Um, he gets to play a couple of hours at the weekends if he's good. If he does anything wrong during the week, boom, that's it. No Ark this weekend. Uh, and I tell you what, it keeps him in line. <laughs> it really keeps him in line. And so he gets to play a bit with me and my mum over the weekend. And like they're just happier for it it's not good for them they shouldn't have these things i'd rather them go play outside go do something go for a walk go hang out with your friends do anything other than sit on a fucking screen you know the ccp are fucking permissive as far as i'm concerned when it comes to all of this shit um so yeah no they're not getting oh, oh the funniest thing one of my son's friends they get he, he, him and his friend came in the other day and i'm just like laying on the couch just like you know watching tv with the wife or whatever and uh his son just, his friend comes up to me and goes can we play your xbox and i was just like no i don't have a fucking xbox and even if i did you couldn't play on it go outside <laughs> like, i'm such an old man but it's like no you know there's literally a whole world out there go and explore it it's fun you know go and go and climb a tree or something but this kid obviously at his own home just plays on his xbox all day it's all fucking day and it's like okay well your kids can it ain't gonna be my kids you know yeah i tell you what, man i watched i i did a thing on academic, academic agents channel about the pizza thing and one thing i was profoundly there's something about the way Peterson is at the moment that I kind of, I feel terrible for him over, right? Like, Peterson is at his best when he's just speaking like a normal human being, when he's just being real, right? He's just being relaxed and he's being introspective. And so, uh, in his conservative manifesto, he bookends it with him just talking and reflecting like a normal person. And he is the compassionate and relatable man that he was when he first came out when he first hit the big time right because i mean do you remember like some of the old lectures where he was like you know finally conservatives have got something to sell which was responsibility personal responsibility you know taking weight on your shoulders you know enough about your rights how many rights do you need you know things like that and it was just 
he was a, a, a really likable guy who was talking. But then in this cassette for manifesto, I just feel like I'm being berated a lot. You know, it's like, you know, he's he's dogmatic. And it's like, that's not him at his best, you know? And I don't know who he's surrounded by or what, you know, why they thought it was a good idea to do that. But like, oh, fuck's sake, my nose. But like, this is, this is not, yeah, exactly. Up yours, woke moralists. It's like, We'll see who cancels who. It's like, dude, they can cancel you anytime they like. Like, we have no power here. You know, it's it, that that was why that rang so hollow. You know. Well, I, I figure I'd finish my whiskey and just get shot off my chest. Uh, to the people in the chat, like, I love how you said you're going to stop three times. Now. And that's the thing. Like, Peterson has been through, obviously been through a hell of a lot. And I do not envy. Like, like it was... You can see the white in my beard, and that was just from the flack I was catching, you know. And, and don't get me wrong, you know, it wasn't easy, but I never had the level of fame and targeting that Peterson has had. And and Peterson is a much more empathetic man than I am, you know. I can tell him, I don't give a fuck about what these leftists think, you know. <laughs> like literally, suck my, you know. I don't care. But Peterson's not like that. He's a much more kind and caring person. So for him. Like what he, what he was saying, he had obviously thought about, and he felt that he was presenting the compassionate case for individuals. Right? It's not like, oh, you know, fat acceptance is good. Otherwise, you're a bigot. It's like no, it's actually not good for them, and it's not good to lie to them and tell them it's good either. Right? And so, Pete, in presenting this case, he had obviously thought it through and expected not to be treated in the way that he was treated. He was treated like absolute shit by these people, like cruel genuinely cruel and it i can see that it's hurt him you know it's genuinely hurt him that people have been this way to him it's not fair and it's not right and it's sorry i'm burping as well it's disgusting what i'm drinking um it, it's not on and i i really don't like it and like i said i really do like peterson as well but like he he's not the guy for the conservative manifesto you know he that's not his wheelhouse and he's overstretching and opening himself up making himself vulnerable in ways that he shouldn't be vulnerable he doesn't need to be vulnerable in. he he should be talking to people about what it is he knows and what he can see in them that they he needs to draw out of them because I, I do think that peace has been phenomenally good for a lot millions of people millions of young people probably hugely benefited from pizza so just keep developing that you know you're really good at that you know that the 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 conservative manifesto i don't think is your wheelhouse you know yeah they were just waiting for an excuse but like i think pizza thought that there was a shred of human decency left in them and i mean there isn't so But again, I don't want any of this to come across like I don't have great respect, admiration, and affection for Jordan Peterson. I genuinely do. You know, I, I, I really, I really appreciate what he was. He did, and I appreciate the man that he is. And I feel bad that he has gone through what he's gone through. You know, and it must have been very, very difficult. So, but I wish you would stop being so angry. You know, I know I know that he feels under attack by a lot of people a lot of the time who are not giving his ideas a fair shrift, a, a fair going over. Um, he needs to realize that those people are not actually very important because they're just like one sided propagandists who write for like the New York Times or something like that. They're not they're not actually people of any genuine merit. They're actually not people that he's that are worth talking to. And so don't get angry at them. Is how I feel. But like I say, there's no good faith, you know. Um, I used to watch you all the time. I'm curious what reasoning you used to justify abuse of animals. I don't think we should abuse animals. I don't ever recall making the case to abuse animals. I think his ordeal kind of broke him. I don't see him recovering anytime soon. His early stuff is great, though. Yeah, like he, I think Peterson feels like he's got to 
save the world. And I don't think any one man can save the world. Like... He's angry because the hell he was warning about is nearly on our doorstep. Yes, but it's not like any of these people are going to listen. So, yeah, I found the vegan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I enjoy eating animals, if that helps. I, I think animals are delicious. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to Pastor Louis. I don't know why he doesn't stream and stuff like that anymore. Um, you know. Modern animal agriculture is abuse. Uh, yeah, you could argue that, I think. You could argue that. But the thing is, I mean, like, not the, the problem that vegans have is they think that all animals are raised in like, animal ag agriculture. Like, you should see British farming. Like, I, like, you see cows in fields, sheep in fields, you know, pigs in fields. And you just drive past them, or, you know, you're on the train, you just go past them. And it's like, okay, but this isn't abuse. This is clearly just animals just eating grass. You know, calm down, buddy. You know? But I mean, I suppose if you're in America, you could make a, an argument. But even then, you know, I'm still going to eat them. Because I'm a hypocrite. Have I seen the direst of all warnings? I have not. Peterson's problem is that he's an honest man. Honest men don't actually believe in the deceit of others until they get destroyed by it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Peterson's problem, and it's not just that he's honest either. He's honest and kind-hearted, right? That's the thing. He, like, you you can't... Like, I, I watched him on Piers Morgan the other day, and you can still see there's still some of the old uh, clinical psychologist in him where he wants to help people, you know, and that's the thing, and I do genuinely think he wants to help people, and like, there's something actually touching about Peterson's compassion and openness, when he talks about the hell everyone has to go through, there really is, there is genuinely something, like, sweet about it, and it, it, it is sad that, like, the leftists can be so callous towards a person like that, because, you don't want to ruin people, right? You know, you don't want to be the reason someone gets ruined. Like, their their emotional state becomes hard and cold. And yet they're quite happy to do this to someone who is otherwise a very open and sensitive man. And and this is ironic when they're, like, sharing music. Look, John Peterson's crying. Ha ha ha. What, is he not manning up? Like, sorry, are we enforcing gender roles all of a sudden? You absolute fucking hypocrites. Like, these are just the worst people in the world. And I I do hate to see them do damage to pizza. I do hate to see it. Man. Anyway, I really should go. Because it is late. And I'm just... I've run out of whiskey now. So, uh... Before I... I don't normally do streams when I'm drunk, do I? I don't normally drink. I don't know why I feel like... like so I'm reading... Uh, I'm rereading Letters from England by Carol K Chapek, which is really fascinating. And I just... I, I find foreign views of England really fascinating. And he wrote a speech for British Radio, right? And uh, there's a bit in here that I was going to do a video on or something like that at some point yeah no I, lo I love this so much right I love this so much he's like uh, in this park called England there live people who are by and large similar to us Europeans he's, he was from the Czech Republic they have houses and high chimneys but around these houses there aren't any railings or walls as in our country which might bar access to strangers but only a tablet on which is written a single potent and magic word which word, the listeners would ask, he, he's having a hypothetical conversation. The word private, the adventurer would continue. In this country, that word has a magical power that replaces railings and ramparts. So that is just the, the perfect description of the Shire, right? Like the, the old, settled, and 
habitual nature of the thing. Oh, the, and, and I tell you, it's totally true, man. In England, oh, I've done it myself. I can think of numerous times in my life where I've been just walking through the countryside and it's like, oh, there's a sign there that's private. I'm not going to go in there. Why? Because I wouldn't want someone going in wherever I've put up a sign that says private, right? And it, it it's so deeply habituated into the English soul, this thing. And uh, and th- there's another bit here as well. After I got into a train and travelled to the capital, a man sat in the carriage with me, but he didn't look at me, and he didn't enter into conversation with me in the least. He didn't ask where I was going or where I, what I wanted there. That's not possible. The continental listeners would clamour. Was the man dumb, as in he couldn't speak? No, the adventurer would say, but in this country they have the custom of being silent, and they don't like to become acquainted. But when I wanted to get out of the train, the man stood up and helped me with my luggage without speaking to me or even or even looking at me. Uh, and it's like, yeah, because he was being polite of your personal space. We still do this now, you know. And he saw that you were struggling with the luggage, and so he gave you a hand. Like it's, it's just like these small ritualistic things that people in England do are just wonderful. Um, and he's uh, and the, 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 there's another bit here that I just love so much, right? So, um, you know, he says that there are many millions of people here, and no one will interfere in another person's business. I saw two drunkards brawling in the street. A policeman stood above them but didn't interfere and didn't disperse them. He only looked on to see that their fight was fair. When I'd learnt a little of the language of the, uh, these islanders, I found that they don't usually say it's raining, two and two or four, but they say, I think it's raining, or rather, I think that two and two are four, and so on. It's as if they continuously and deliberately leave the other person the freedom to be of another opinion. I've even noticed that everyone is free to run across the grass there. At this, the Continental listeners wouldn't be able to restrain themselves any longer and say to the adventurer, Mr. Chapek, you're an enormous liar. As in, this, he makes it sound like such, and this was written in like the 20s. He makes, he makes our country sound like such a magical place, man. And like, and this is not unique either, right? I've read, lo- right from the early 20th century, there were loads of foreigners who came to this country and would talk about just how magical England was. I saw an LBC a while ago, this Holocaust survivor, who um, who was going on that. He wasn't, I can't remember what he was talking about, but he was uh, asked, you know, so what was, is, you know, what was England like when you came here? He was like, oh, I thought England was a magical place. It's not like the now. It's been ruined with immigration. <laughs> it's just gone to the dogs now. And it's like, yeah, it really fucking has, man. It really fucking has. And, you know, thank God for the free market. <laughs> I don't know what I'm just rambling about now, but it's just like, I, I just saw it on my desk. I was reading it the other day. It's, it's just, I I love this conception of the world. I love that that's how things should be, you know, just small and polite and well-mannered and decent and respectful of one another. And we are not in that world anymore. That world is gone. I'm nostalgic for a world that does no longer exist. And so I'm just... And the thing is, right, you, like, it takes so much time and energy and willpower to get to a position where you can have it that people will accept that the sign that says private means that no one goes in there. It takes so much to get to that position. Like, you, no, nowhere else outside of, like, the English-speaking world would that have happened, really, uh, as Carol Chabok pointing out. Like you, you, you don't get the South America, you don't get in Africa, you don't get in Asia. You know, you need you need walls and ramparts and things like that. But but in England we actually had it so that actually everyone was respectful of that, right? And we should have treated that with so much more care and respect, and we should have cherished that because now it's gone. I don't know if it can ever be revived, like the old England that actually existed. I, I'm also reading a book called uh, In Search of England by Henry Morton, who's a journalist again in the 20s, who was just driving around England because he, he nearly died out in Palestine. And he was like, oh, my God, I'm never going to see England again. And so when he got back, he he was just like driving around and just exploring the place. And it was just like, you know, like the romance of the country that we used to have just got completely obliterated in the middle of the 20th century and there's no there's no one person you can point to and say right it's your fault tony blair but there are certain people who really miscarried and honestly i think if i was put in charge i'd probably hang them on war crimes you know i'd bring back the death penalty and have them tried and hanged i think 
for for what they've done but that's but the thing is that still wouldn't fix the problem <laughs> and like it it wouldn't it, like it wouldn't bring back this country that we've lost that again is still within living memory and it's just sad to me that so quickly just within a couple of generations within my lifetime you know the last 20 25 years the country can be literally destroyed it's that quickly but i'm gonna i'm gonna definitely gonna stop now right thank you for joining me folks um well no like you know this 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 yeah well look the death penalty was something that was insanely popular in england in fact uh it's not in this one it's in uh the english other human which was a, a book written by a dutch uh was he historian i think it was uh just some professor in the 30s and he was deeply disappointed so obviously on the continent oh the death penalties barbar barbaric how could you and he was like yeah but the english love the death penalty <laughs> absolutely love it and i bet if you polled people now you would get a majority in favor of the death penalty you know and I, I because the death penalty like it speaks to this kind of pagan morality that still underpins england the wrongdoer needs an equal recompense for the crime they've committed right and certain people have done such irreparable damage to this country that the death penalty is it, it's not even enough to repay them for the damage that they've done. Now, you know, I'm not suggesting violence or anything like that. I'm suggesting a judicial process, you know, as in they should go for a trial. The, the punishment, let me have the death penalty in America, you know. So, you know, there are certain people in America who deserve the death penalty for the terrible things they do. Well, I think we need to bring the death penalty back, actually. You know, I'm actually not against that. I actually think that there are certain crimes that are so heinous that someone needs to genuinely swing from a gallows on you know raping a child murdering a mother you know like there are loads of things where it's just horrible such horrible inhuman things that these people they deserve to swing they deserve the lethal injection or whatever you know weak ass form of execution that we use these days they deserve it you know and and this is a question of justice and i i think that's i think it's fair so maybe i will take this stream down now <laughs> because <laughs> i don't know what youtube's rules on saying i think the death penalty should be reinstated are that um yeah the noose is the british method yeah i know i saw people that are like oh we need to guillotine it's like okay frenchy calm down fuck off back to france we hang people here yeah the, the noose is the uh the traditional british method bring back guillotine no go back to france yeah obviously public because the thing is right and oh uh, so in uh in um in search of england he henry goes to this uh this one town that has gallows hill right and they still have the gallows on the silks again it's the 20s or the 30s so they, they still have hanging and uh he tells he tells the reader about the last hanging but he also tells them why it happened like it was this this couple who murdered their children and it's like right why because they wanted to elope or something you know this, 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 i can't remember exactly what it was now but they murdered their own children and it was like okay yeah i think they i think they deserve to hang i think people who deliberately murder their own children just out of convenience are evil they deserve to hang for that that's not wrong to say they deserve to hang that's that's a question of justice and what is just and child murderers i think they deserve the death penalty i don't think that's crazy I don't think that's out of out of the realm of like you know reasonable considerations of justice, but uh, anyway, I, I think I will take this stream down because you know <laughs> I just <laughs> yeah, YouTube isn't American; it's Californian. Exactly. If YouTube were based in Texas, pff, it would be no problem, uh, but it's not. Uh, so yeah I, I better go and delete this stream but uh, anyway folks it's been it's been lovely speaking to you all and uh, that's why i'm just